Hello, hello. This is Father Adam greeting all of you on this Good Friday with some good news for you today that I know that you can use. And we call this day good because we have the forecast of Easter Sunday, which lets us know that something better is coming. You know, I will never forget in my first parish this lady who was diagnosed with a deadly illness and was given weeks to live. She called all her family and friends over to her house and she invited me as the priest to be there as well where she wanted to express her final wishes and she told us the songs that she would like to have played at her funeral and the readings that she would like to have read at her funeral and that she would like to be buried with her favorite Bible and then as I'm about to leave she says wait father there is one more thing I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. I was quite shocked and didn't know what to say. And then she explained that her favorite part of being part of our parish church was when we had church gatherings, dinners, and as someone was cleaning the table after the main dish was served, they would lean over and they would say, you can keep the fork, because that meant, she said, that something better was coming. Something better was coming you can keep the fork. Usually, she said, it was a scrumptious, delicious, mmm, mmm, finger-licking dessert, like ice cream or cake or pie. So when people, she says, see me with a fork in my right hand, in the casket, at the viewing, I want them to wonder, what's with the fork? And then I want you to tell them, she points at me. And then I want you, Father Adam, to tell them that something better is coming. That is a perfect illustration for us on this Good Friday. Because this day has the cross at the forefront of the celebration. And the cross for us is a gate to something better, knowing that something better is coming, the resurrection. In an old African tradition, when people greet each other, they say, one person says to the next, I see you, and the other person replies, I am here. Good Friday is the day to see Jesus and to be here and to ask the question, what's happening as Jesus hangs there? Who's being crucified? It's easy to say the historical Jesus who walked 2,000 years ago on earth. But Jesus continues to walk right here in our midst, in our body, in us, and in the body of those around you. Your body is Christ's body, and the body of those around you is Christ's. And when this body, your body, is crucified, or the body of somebody around you, Jesus is crucified. Right now, the crucifixion is still happening in hospital rooms, in natural disasters, 
in the problem-filled lives we lead, in our issues, in pandemics, in your addiction, and just like 2,000 years ago, people to this very day crucify people. The Romans wanted to shame people through the crucifixion process. And we do this to this very day. We are ashamed in our own suffering and problems. And so often the shame comes from other people in our life who shame us. They curse us. That's what the word curse comes from. Mal dicere in Latin. Bad words. We continue to curse one another, shame one another by calling each other names and bringing one another down and discriminating against one another. We continue to place each other on the cross, not blessing each other. That's where the word blessing comes from. Benedicere in Latin, good words. But we inflict pain and anguish on each other through our tongue. We kill one another, crucify one another with our tongues. So much hatred as is evidenced in the recent attacks on the Asian community in our country. The cruelty of one person inflicting pain and anguish on another. It wasn't the Romans or the Jewish leaders or the people 2,000 years ago that crucified Jesus. We crucify, crucify, and I say it correctly, we crucify Jesus to this very day. We continue to place Jesus on the cross. When we kill those around us with our words, with our mistreatment, with our discrimination, with violence, with hatred, the cruelty of one person inflicting pain and anguish on another. Jesus continues to be crucified to this very day in the pain that is inflicted on his body, which is you and me. I will never forget walking into Auschwitz and noticing a sign on the wall in that infamous concentration camp set up by the Nazis during the Second World War. I've been there nine times. And on the wall there, there is an inscription that reads, this, the gas chambers, the torture, the burning of millions of human bodies, this is what one human being prepared for another. We prepare concentration camps and gas chambers and torture chambers for one another through our sinfulness, just as we prepared the cross for Jesus. And we continue to do that to this very day. Look at the George Floyd trial that is going on right now for the murder of George Floyd, the African-American man in Minnesota who months ago was brutally murdered. And we can recognize the powerful and the mighty suffocating a man crying, I can't breathe. 
I want my mama. One human being suffocating another just because he could. Because he had a uniform, wielded guns, and was empowered to do so. People in uniforms and with weapons put Jesus on the cross and suffocated him too. That's how you die on the cross. You don't die from hanging there. You die because you are gasping for air and you can't breathe and your lungs fill with water and you slowly suffocate. That video being played over and over again of George Floyd having a knee on his neck being slowly suffocated is precisely what happened to Jesus. Jesus continues to be suffocated, murdered, have his breath taken out of him. And just like George Floyd cried for his mama, Jesus cried for his mama as well. Mama Mary, his mama Mary. He looked there from the cross, John's Gospel tells us, and he saw his mother. I'm sure George Floyd saw his mom too as he closed his eyes. That image that Jesus saw. The crucifixion hasn't just happened once. It continues in every human being who has their life sucked out of them one breath at a time. One knee on their neck pressed harder and harder second by second. When your marriage is torn by infidelity, the crucifixion happens. When your spouse of 35 years says, I have someone else. I don't love you anymore. In fact, maybe I never really loved you. That suffocates you. You're on the cross. The crucifixion happens when you feel forgotten and abandoned and alone because no one cares enough to invite you for Easter dinner or bothers to see if you have an invite or who you will be with for Easter, the crucifixion happens. People alone this Easter is this one lady who called me, told me that her son, her only son, called her and said, Mom, you can join us for Easter dinner via Zoom, but only for 40 minutes because that's my limit on Zoom. I haven't paid for an upgraded Zoom account. She's being crucified in her loneliness. Parents who choose alcohol and work and money and stuff over their children crucify their kids. My friend last year who committed suicide, a priest my age, last February, before the pandemic hit, he killed himself. He told his mom that he no longer wanted to be a priest. And she said, if you leave the priesthood, it will kill me. He went home and took a bottle of sleeping pills and never woke up. Instead of her saying, it's okay, son, I love you, whether you're a priest or a hamburger flipper at McDonald's. It doesn't matter. You are always my son, no matter what. We crucify each other. These mother and son stories in my own life have been at the forefront for me this week. 
as I have been following closely the trial of the police officer who murdered George Floyd. And what makes the most impact on me is George crying for his mother. Mama, he says, Mama, Mama. I think of Jesus on the cross, those three sentences from John's gospel. Behold your mother. Behold your son. The meeting, especially that scene from Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, when Jesus meets his mother, how they looked at each other. Behold your mother. That response of the mother should be our response as well. Whenever anyone in our life suffers or is faced with their own crucifixion, the response of the mother. What is Mary's response to Jesus being on the cross? She's there. Mary was there. She didn't take Jesus off of the cross or demand that he be taken down. She was there. She accompanied him. Everyone else left and abandoned him. The apostles left. Peter left. All of them. But his mother was there. How wonderful it is to have a mother. Even God wanted to have a mother. So great is the love of a mother. Mary didn't leave when faced with her son's crucifixion. When I was at Pelican Bay, one of the prisoners was going to be transported after he was sentenced to death. He was going to be transported down, in, down to San Quentin, where the death row is here in California. And there were people picketing outside on both sides of the death penalty debate. Some were shouting in favor of the death penalty, and some were shouting against it. And there I see this woman, and she's not shouting, and she's not in either side. She didn't join any of the groups. And so I approached her, and I said, and how come you're not in any of the groups here? Why are you here all by yourself? And she looks at me, and she says, I am his mother, the one they're shouting about, yelling to kill. Most of them were. I am his mother. The mother is there. God is our mother. He's always there no matter what tries to crucify us in this life, God is always there. Everyone can abandon you. God will never abandon you. Everyone else left and abandoned Jesus, but not his mother. She didn't leave. When faced with your own children's problems, you know you can't take them out of the problems, but you can be there in the problems. As Mary didn't take Jesus off of the cross, but she was there. When a child is scared at night, what calms them down? Running into the parent's bedroom and climbing in bed with their mom or dad.
It restores calmness and brings comfort. The parent doesn't enter the child and remove the problem. The parent is there in the midst of the problem. In the midst of the darkness, the child climbs into the bed with their parent, and then they calm down. That's what God does with us. And that's what God wants to do with you. And that's what God wants you to do with those around you, to be there. Not to solve people's problems, but to be there. To be there with one another in our problems. Emmanuel, God with us. Not the God who solves all of our problems, but the God who is with us in our problems. So don't try to solve your family members' problems. Be there for them in their problems. Walk with them. Stand there by the cross. Show them the fork after the main meal. Something better is waiting for you. Something better is yet to come. That's why we call this Good Friday, not Bad Friday, because it's good. Every cross is a gateway to the resurrection. I will never forget a 26-year-old young man dying of AIDS when I just started out as a priest. He had been disowned by his parents and shunned by the family. He was thrown out of his house because, as they said, it's his sinful lifestyle. And he was dying alone. They threw him out of the home, and he sought love and acceptance and understanding and warmth and intimacy in all the wrong places. That's what we do. We throw people out in this throwaway culture, and then they go out looking, begging for love and acceptance and understanding, and only find worse problems and suffering. He wanted to see his mother, this 26-year-old young man. So I did all I could to get her to see him. I called, and she refused to even talk to me. So when all failed, I resorted to the old-fashioned visit, and I knocked on her door, and I begged her to come and see him. And she came to see him, and he was all but maybe 85 pounds, and she didn't recognize him. And then he said to her, Mom, and through his voice, she recognized her little boy. I'm seeing this scene right now before my eyes. And she began to sob, saying, Father, she says, Father, look what they have done to my little boy. Father, look what they have done to my little boy. I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, they? They? Who are the they that you're speaking of? She was probably referring to the crowd that he was hanging out with or 
wherever he got HIV or whatever. She was thinking in her head, I don't know. But they? What are you talking about? I thought to myself, you, not they, you. You are the one who threw him out on the streets and wanted nothing to do with him. Proclaiming so-called tough love. You have a hand in this too. Don't be like Pilate washing your hands. I have nothing to do with the death of this man, Pilate said. And that's what we do over and over again in our own life. We want to wash our hands of any type of responsibility. Of the pain that we inflict and those around us, you want to wash your hands of the responsibility in your families and in your marriages, always saying, my husband's the problem, my children are the problem, everybody else except you. You've had nothing to do with it. Just like today, you had nothing to do with the death of Jesus. That's what you feel. It's those people 2,000 years ago that crucified him, not me. I'm just this bystander, and I come to make myself feel good on this Good Friday. Because Jesus died some 2,000 years ago. No, we continue to kill him today. In the way we treat each other in the way we shun, in our discrimination, in our judgments, in the fact that we feel we are better than other people. Oh, but I don't kill like the people who come and say, you know, I haven't, you know, I've been hearing confessions before Easter, you know, and a lot of people uh, come, Father, you know, I don't know why you say we have to go to confession. I haven't done anything. You know, I haven't killed anyone. And, you know, oh, no, with that tongue of yours, With the names you've called your husband? With the judgments you've passed? All this political rhetoric? This negativity in our midst? The fear? The violence? The division that we keep inflicting on ourselves? Dividing ourselves? Making each other out to be enemies? But we don't have any responsibility for crucifying people, right? Because it makes us feel good, right? No, some other people did it, right? Mm -hmm. It's nice to be a spectator. It's another thing to own responsibility for what is going on. We continue to crucify people. We don't want to walk with one another in this life, accept each other. I will never forget meeting this another young man in Las Vegas, and he said when he was part of his parish, he was part of the choir, and he came in once to the choir, and everybody goes through identity issues in their life, and you know, we're all human beings, and he came in to the choir, and he was dressed like a woman, and the priest came up to him and said, you can't be here. Get out of here. We don't want your type here. You're kind. And he left the church where he felt accepted, where he had a community, especially being part of the choir. And he went into a life of going to bars, sleeping around, drugs. The church sent him out into that life. And the church is all of us. We shun people. We throw people out. We, we pass judgments. We don't accept people. We don't walk with people. We don't want to be Mary who accompanies Jesus on her journey to the cross 
on his way of the cross. We want to get rid of the problem, throw people away. Like they did to this young man. To do away with them. That's what this mom did to her son. And that's what that priest did to this young man. But it's not what Mary does. And it's not what we are called to do. Was it easy for Mary? No. And it's not easy for any of us either. Jesus is not some idea floating out out there. We are his body. Jesus is made real in us. St. Teresa of Avila teaches us that. We are Christ, she says. We are Christ's presence. Paul teaches us that so very well in the Bible. But we don't want that. We want the God who floats out there somewhere. We don't want to see people and be here for them. We don't like this African way of greeting people. We like to say, hi, how are you? But we don't really care for the response, right? We don't like to greet each other like they do in Africa. I see you. And the person responds, I'm here. It's all because we want to be right. We want to point to others as sinful. And today we want to say it's the Romans. No, it's not the Romans or the Jews. It's you and I that continued to kill Jesus. Killing people inside, in their spirit. So is Jesus dying today? Or is he rising? That's the question on this Good Friday. Are we celebrating the dying of Jesus or the rising? So many people say, you know, talk about dead people. Well, they're the real living. They're in heaven with God. We are the ones who are dying. And we hope to rise. They are the living. Those who have passed on are the living. We are the dying ones. Every day is a day that we are closer to our end. We are the ones who are dying. But Jesus wasn't just dying. He was also rising. We have a God who is dying, given a giving away everything in order to show us how to live. So what's Jesus doing up there on the cross? He's both dying and rising. His finest hour. So you see, it all depends on how you look at it. When you are on your own cross, are you dying or are you dying and rising? Because, as Jesus says, in order to live, you have to die. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Die to rise. Let's remind ourselves today that in whatever cross we may find ourselves in, the best is yet to come. Hello, hello!